Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to announce the seminar by Carlo Ravelli. He will tell us about the end of evaporation. Please, approximately one hour. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Rina. Um, thank you, all of you. I actually have gone to the names. I've seen several friends. Uh, um, so hello to everybody that I know and everybody I don't know. Thank you for being here. I'm going to talk about the end of a black hole uh, hi, evaporation. Uh, yeah. Can you share your slides? Well, I'm, you I'm will show I'm, your slides in the I'm, moment. I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, okay, okay. I, 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 I was just yeah. I was just introducing. So, uh, but if okay, you want okay. me to, Sorry. to do to do it immediately, I can do it immediately. Here it is. Okay. So that's the title for the moment. It's just the end of the evaporation. And uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is to uh, sort of summarize uh, a, a rather large body of uh, uh, of work. Me and a lot of my colleagues. Uh, I will not put a lot of references. Uh, if you want references, just uh, uh, ask me or go to the main one I, 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 I present and then uh, um, uh, the, 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 there are citations to other papers. Um, there will not may be many references in the, in the, in the slide themselves. Uh, but I'm gonna present uh, uh, some results of my, some results of my collaborators, and in fact, of a rather large number of uh, uh, people who have been working on uh, trying to understand what happened uh, at the end of the operation of a black hole. And uh, the messages I'm going to uh, deliver, uh, I am sort of anticipated here in four points, uh, which will become clear in the, in, in, in the talks. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> that, of course, there's enormous amount of work on the uh, black hole, black hole, um, quantum effect on black holes, information puzzle, and so on and so forth. So, and uh, there is an idea that one can ignore the end of the evaporation, which uh, it has some merit, but it has some serious danger. And I want to uh, uh, argue that uh, by uh, ignoring it, uh, we uh, make a mistake because uh, uh, what happened at the end of the evaporation uh, does bear on some assumptions, which are often given for granted uh, in discussing what happened before. Uh, so what I say doesn't regard just the end of the evaporation, it regards also what happened before. Um, second, that just because of that, uh, a consistent scenario exists um, where you can uh, have uh, standard quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is not violated in all the sort of uh, uh, region which, uh, uh, where the curvature is low. Uh, so in all the region, we, we might expect uh, uh, naively to be <clears throat> um, uh, governed, uh, to be described by classical general relativity and standard uh, quantum theory and curve space time. With, no, with unitarity at infinity, no information loss and no page curve. Uh, and this, I will argue, is compatible with uh, the calculations like in string theory and others that give the... So the number of black holes uh, state uh, um, uh, uh, to be governed by the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, provided that things are correctly uh, interpreted. So this might be cryptic at this point, but I hope it will become clear in a moment. And uh, uh, then I will uh, elaborate specifically of how this scenario uh, can be uh, uh, realized. Uh, and I'll argue that uh, uh, it, it's a physical problem that requires quantum gravity. In fact, it's three distinct problems. There are three distinct so space-time region uh, disconnected uh, uh, from one another, I mean, causally and related to one another, which I call A and B and C. And uh, um, without going into many details, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll say how this, all these three regions have been studied and are being studied using uh, loop quantum gravity uh, tools. And the a picture that comes um, out of this is a picture a scenario, which was in fact, uh, considering the past, uh, um, which I'll, I'll, I'll say in a moment what it is, and discarded on the basis of some argument, some classical arguments, which I will argue do not apply uh, when you look at things in, in detail. So what is the scenario? Well, the scenario is this one. Um, Instead of the uh, sort of common idea that at the end of the evaporation of the black hole, the black hole sort of pops out of existence and all its energy is gone, so there's nothing remaining. And therefore, 
the uh, horizon, it's a um, event horizon. Um, what happens at the end of the black hole is uh, a, a, a quantum position when the black hole is very small with an anti-trapping horizon forming um, so that, uh, so very naively, I'll, I'll go in detail, the, the, um, the horizon itself is not an event horizon and uh, there is a, an anti-trapping region in the future and uh, um, there is no uh, information loss because information will come out. Of course, a lot of details have to be filled uh, filled in. So the scenario here is that uh, um, in the future, after the evaporation, at the end of the evaporation, sort of here, the Hawking radiation comes out to infinity here, uh, there is a remnant, uh, which is a long living, small, uh, sort of plank sized remnant, uh, which actually can be described uh, to some extent classically with some quantum, which I'll say, in a moment, which I'll say at the, toward the end. Uh, as a white hole, so the, the interior of a, of a um, uh, anti-trapped uh, uh, surface, uh, which uh, slowly emits uh, information and has a very long, uh, finite but very long uh, time. So that's the plan of what I'm going to say. There will be some preliminaries, which are important. And I think to many of you, uh, that might be the most interesting part, because I'm going to address in detail um, kind of different assumptions one need in studying black holes, one, sh uh, one should take uh, in studying black holes uh, um, if one doesn't disregard what happened at, at, at the end. So I'll talk about uh, a, a number of points. Then I will describe the, the, the transition, sort of the, the, the green region here and, and the white region, the full, the full space, and what we know about, about this and the different uh, uh, pieces of information we get from, in particular from loop quantum gravity, the transition. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, but it will be brief, I'll uh, discuss uh, what kind of remnant this scenario, this possibility uh, predicts uh, and uh, um, why the classical argument against remnant do not apply in this case. And I will just uh, mention this phenom phenomenology. There's actually a large, rather large amount of uh, papers that explore the phenomenology of this scenario, but I will not go into that. I'll just say that it exists. All right. So preliminaries, that's the first part. So the first one, um, this is a, a, I'm going to say something trivial, but it's a, I think it's, there's a confusion here. There's really a confusion in the literature. So um, let me address it. And I apologize for saying things which might be obvious to some of you. Um, there is often a, a, a point made in discussing the black hole information paradox uh, that the von Neumann entropy is bounded, it must be uh, smaller than the thermodynamical entropy, all right? Uh, let me just uh, go through the argument, which is super simple. Uh, thermodynamical entropy, you can def define thermodynamically, but of course you, you, you think entropy is classical in the sense of Boltzmann and quantum mechanics. It's uh, um, given by the logarithm of dimensional is the space of the logarithm of dimensional the number of degrees of freedom. N is the number of degrees of freedom of a system whose entropy you're studying. Now, suppose this system, um, call it uh, B, uh, it's uh, entangled, is in a state, psi AB, which is entangled with some external system A, say, I think, an observer that looks at it. And there's some entanglement. Then you want to uh, quantify this entanglement. You quantify this entanglement with the von Neumann entropy. And the von Neumann entropy, you just take the, 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 the density matrix, you trace over uh, uh, B, right? So you, if you trace over B, you, you, you get uh, the, the density matrix of A, you compute the von Neumann entropy of A. And it's just a line to show that, uh, of course, this is maximized when uh, you have zero information, when rho A is proportional to the identity. So if you put it here, uh, you get this one. So at most, the von Neumann entropy is the uh, thermodynamic entry. So you get this, which is presented as a theory. But, 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 but that's not true always, because of course, it's not always true that the um, uh, thermodynamic entropy is the number of degrees of freedom. You need ergodicity, you need mixing, you need some properties that the system it's, it's able to uh, to thermalize so um, and 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 these are far from uh, these are far from trivial uh, it's very easy to come up with examples in which the thermodynamic entropy is less 
than the number of degrees of freedom because uh, you know something blocks the equipartition of energy and a, an example and in fact a relevant example for what we're interested on is this one is when the the the, the system you're looking look at the system b here um uh splits in two parts, which are space, space like separated, it's not causally connected. So let's imagine you have a system B, which get entangled and entangled with a system A, okay? So there's a von Neumann entropy, um, which of course it's uh, uh, less than the number of degrees of freedom B. That's what we just proved. But now, if you, uh, if the system B splits in two parts, okay, and uh, say that this and this part are, are very distant, spatially separated, and you interact just with, ha with this part here, with B1, the exchanges of heat and work between A and B1 are not uh, affected by the fact that the number, the degrees of freedom in B2. So the thermodynamical entropy is, the num is given by the number of degrees of freedom of B1 alone. And the number of degrees of B1 alone, of course, is less than the number of degrees of freedom of B. So that's a case in which that doesn't hold anymore. Now that's trivial, but that's immediately relevant for uh, 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 black hole entropy. And, and, and uh, this is just one piece of the argument. And we'll see the other piece of the argument. Uh, because if at the end of the evaporation here, uh, the, 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 the black hole doesn't disappear entirely. The thermodynamical entropy observed Carlo, by an observer. Can I ask a question? Yeah. About the previous slide. How about the? Oh, the previous about slide. The, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, so uh, you're you're saying that you have this box B, and yeah. the left and right sides are entangled with each other. No. I'm saying that uh, the, the full box B is entangled with A. The full box B is entangled with A, okay. Yeah. So there is some entanglement between both sides of the box individually yeah. and with A. Yeah. Now you, now you uh, break apart the boxes and send them somewhere yeah. far apart. And then uh, the observer exchanges, there is some interaction between the observer and the one, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the thing is that that if to begin with the observer is entangled with the all the many of the degrees of freedom in the box that would include degrees of freedom in the yeah. left hand side also box also. So when when this heat and work exchange happens between the observer and the green side of the box, due to that entanglement, it would also affect the degrees of freedom in the in the orange side of the box, would it not? Oh, maybe. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that the thermodynamic entropy uh, that A uh, would measure in interacting, exchanging work and heat uh, uh, with B1, uh, it's uh, given the number of degrees of freedom B1. Very simple. Suppose you put energy here, okay? Then energy equipartite, okay? And so it becomes heat, and that's, uh, that's what entropy is... is, is uh, it, it's calculating, it's, uh, it, it's specific. How many degrees of freedom uh, entropy get mixed with? Well, it definitely does not get mixed with B2. There's no doubt of that. That's solid. That's completely solid. That's elementary no, that, that's physics. Fine. That's fine. I, I guess I can talk about it. You, you're right you. that by, you're right that because there's entanglement, of course, things affect another, one another, but they affect one another in the sense of, you know, EPR correlations and stuff like that, not in the sense that increases number of degrees of freedom. If your, if your box is correlated with something else, nothing that you do with this box alone knows that. The only way to know that is to make, to study correlation, to, to, see, to, to see both. Everything you, uh, otherwise, you know, if you if you if you interact with an atom, you the atom is correlated with everything else. So why why don't we why don't you see the other degrees of freedom? Because to see the correlation, you have to see both. So let me go let me go ahead because okay, sure. then we, um, I'm happy to go back if you want to go into to, to detail. So um, I mean the the relevance of that for for black hole physics is open to discussion. But what is written is transparency. I, I would. My opinion is that it's not open to discuss, just a fact. Uh, 
All right. So now this is open to discussion. So if the uh, the 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 the, the at, at the end of the evaporation. Um, uh, black hole doesn't disappear, then there is a, 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 the, the observer at infinity sees has a different is a different story up to the point where you know you get the first signal of the transition and after. Up to that point, of course, it is like for you as if uh, this was an event horizon because this is, is outside your past future. So the only uh, you definitely cannot interact with uh, with what is inside. That's especially uh, separated. And so the relevant entropy for you is given by the number of degrees of freedom on the, on the boundary, not the number of degrees of freedom inside. Now, let me go to the second point, because by, by, by putting all the pieces together, I think this becomes more clear. So the second point, I sort of have see, said it already, but for those of you who have just a little bit less familiar about these things, uh, an event horizon is something else. The trapping horizon, just you know, apologies for saying trivial things, but an event horizon is a band with uh, uh, the past of all future uh, null infinity, uh, which means that it's it's uh, it, it separates the reason for which uh, light cannot come out uh, ever. While a trapping horizon or a dynamical horizon or a parent horizon. It's a, a, a local, a much more local thing. It's a quasi-local thing, and it's uh, uh, the boundary of the region where the, uh, so the expansion is negative uh, in the uh, of of of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the outgoing um, late, right, uh, light surface. So it's it's a boundary where light cannot come out there, but doesn't know anything about what happened later. And if, again. Uh, in classically, the horizon of black hole is an event horizon, of course, um, and uh, it is also an event horizon if at the end of the evaporation, pop, the, the, the black hole magically pops out of existence, uh, but is, um, uh, let's go careful because, uh, uh, and, and, and that's, I think, is a subtle point of, of, of the story. We expect quantum gravity to come in when the curvature is large. So uh, sort of near R equals zero. And if you don't have Hawking radiation, of course, uh, the outside this is never going to happen because for a large black hole, uh, the curvature is going to be large uh, on the horizon and outside. But if you have, um, um, if you have uh, Hawking radiation, the uh, area of the horizon is going to shrink. So at some point, um, the horizon area is going to come down to Planckian values. And the curvature, of course, goes as a mass over the radius cube, uh, which near the horizon is just one of the radius square. So the curvature becomes Planckian outside the horizon, right? So you expect quantum gravity phenomena to happen outside the horizon. And that's the key point. Quantum gravity phenomena happens outside the horizon if there is Hawking radiation. And, and we give for granted that there is. Which means that everything that happened in the future of this quantum gravity part, uh, it's determined by quantum gravity, not by classical physics. But the future, I mean, this is a little corner of the Penthros Carter diagram, but it's an immense region of space time. This is the largest region of space time, because this is a conformal diagram. So we have no idea, unless we interrogate quantum gravity, of what happens in the future on the, in, in the last part, the last infinite part of, the, um, of null infinity. So what happened to you if you're far away? Right. So uh, the uh, idea that uh, a uh, black hole has an event horizon, it's probably wrong. Black holes don't have event horizon, right? Or, or might be if quantum gravity says that something magically the horizon reforms in some, in some way. But it is a quantum gravity thing. You have to ask quantum gravity. You cannot assume that it's, a, it's an event horizon, as it is done in most discussions about black holes. Black holes is not an event horizon. Black holes is a, is a, is a horizon, which uh, uh, we don't know what's gonna, where it's an event horizon, unless we do quantum gravity, okay? Uh, there's no event horizon here, of course. This is an apparent horizon, because in the future you, uh, you look back. Now, uh, another point, preliminary three, uh, the interior of the black hole is non-stationary. And that's somehow something that you learn in uh, generativity classes, and then you forget 
when you become a scientist and start working on black hole. And everybody treats black holes as stationary things. Black holes are not stationary things. The outside of black holes are stationary things. In fact, the article by Finkelstein that figured out what happened at the horizon, right, it's a one-way surface, uh, it started, the title was uh, um, sort of uh, uh, a, uh, an isotropy, the time direction in the gravitational field of a point mass. The horizon is not... Uh, Time reversal invariant, and this particular is not stationary, and the interior is not stationary. There's nothing stationary inside. Now, can we describe black holes as a stationary thing? Of course, but then this we describe the outside, not the inside. So, in particular, if you take the, the description, for instance, the string description, which is a very good description of what happened to the, it's a stationary state, right? The Strominger Waffa calculation, or whatever came after that. And the same, the loop quantum gravity uh, calculation. It's a stationary thing. Stationary thing means that you're describing this, this part of the universe, not what happened late, which is not stationary, obviously. So once again, you're describing this part of the space-time, which doesn't include the, the interior. So much so that the coordinates in which the um, calculation are done do not include the interior, right? So definitely you're describing that. So of course you're uh, computing a number of degrees of freedom, which is a correct number of degrees of freedom, counted by an observer, which is at a distance and can wait a long time, but only until um, something happened at the end of the operation. An observer who lives longer, for an observer who lives longer, that calculation is wrong, okay? So, I mean, there's more in, in the universe than that. And there might be much more in the universe. This is an exchange of limits. You cannot say, uh, oh, but the difference is small. The difference can be large. There's nothing that says the difference can be small. Uh, and, and, and the related thing, uh, this is often confusing, I think, the intuition when thinking about black holes. I'm going to the end of my preliminaries here. Um, the singularity of black hole is in the future. It's not inside, okay? So uh, the, um, uh, uh, what happens inside the black hole is non-stationary. So, any physical intuition of what happened must be non-stationary. Of course, uh, an intuition about what happened with time needs a um, foliation, but there's a natural one because there is a, the last surface before entering the quantum gravity regime, which is given by where the uh, curvature becomes Planckian, of course, or approaches becoming Planckian. So you can take that as a surface and you can foliate. So roughly the foliation of constant radius, constant Schwarzschild radius, which is time coordinate in, in fact. And you can look at the geometry of these uh, uh, surfaces, this foliation. The geometry is very easy to work out. This is a simple general relativity. This is the geometry. I mean, this is the calculation, but this is a picture. So inside this, this the geometry of the surface is a tube. It's a tube with a radius and a length, finite and in. In the, in the bottom of it, there's not a singularity. In the bottom of it, there's a falling star, okay? Of course, time goes at different speed in GR, obviously. So uh, the time here is slow, the time is little, the time outside is big. Um, but that's the correct intuition of what happened inside the black hole. And as time goes on, the black hole becomes, the interior becomes narrower, this... Uh, circles, which in reality are spheres, of course, shrinks, and uh, the length grows. This is just, uh, you read it, this is an equation here. It grows a lot, and the volume grows. The volume grows. I mean, the, the length grows more than the, uh, the shrinking. Just to give you an idea, if you take a, a, a solar-sized black hole and you wait until the end of evaporation, um, the, the length of this tube is 10 to the 75 light years. So that's what really is a black hole. Long, long, long things that uh, um, uh, that goes. So as time goes up, that's the way of thinking about it. It becomes longer and longer and longer, which means, and that's the key point, that an old black hole with a small throat, it's a totally different beast than a young black hole with a small throat. Because a long black hole, uh, an old black hole is, is a bigger throat and has become smaller. So black hole have no hair, okay? But this doesn't mean that inside the brain they have the same thing. That doesn't mean that they have the same head because they have no hair. Inside, they're completely different things. The, the, the interior of black hole is not uniquely determined by um, the shape of its horizon. So that's the way of thinking about that. 
out, right? So the, the, the star forms is always in the bottom. The black hole become longer, longer, longer. At some point, you get into the quantum region. And if you fall, of course, you're going to go to the star. You go in the future toward the, um, toward the quantum uh, region. That's what I said. So black hole um, can have a small throat and a large interior. Two black holes with the same horizon can be very different. So if you want to think about them as quantum uh, system, you have other quantum numbers beside those that characterize the horizon. So that's it for the preliminary observations. Let me summarize. Phenomenon entropy can be higher than the thermodynamical entropy. There is no reason to expect the black hole is an event horizon. The black hole interior is not stationary. The singularity, the quantum gravity region in the future and the interior uh, keep growing. So this uh, various preliminary observation uh, make this uh, 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 right picture here uh, plausible. Let me now shift gear and say that it's not plausible, but there's some physics that uh, support it. So I want to say that uh, uh, this scenario is, is possible uh, according to what we understand about nature today. First of all, there's a large part of it, or the white part of it, it's classical vacuum GR. So it should be a solution of the Einstein equations. And uh, it's surprising for relativists who haven't thought about that. It was totally surprising when it came out a few years ago. Uh, but there is a solution of a uh, vacuum Einstein equations that describe exactly that. Why is it surprising? Because we're, we're told at school that there's Birkhoff theorem and there's only one solution, uh, which is uh, 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 spherically symmetric. And, uh, and that's Kluskal. And that's not Kluskal because that's not, that's not a subset of Kluskal. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that this uh, blue area, which is an exact solution, right? it's a solution, is locally isomorphic to Kluskal, but not globally. In fact, you can obtain from Kluskal by cutting and, uh, this, this and, and, and pasting. And of course, you can do that because there's a quantum region where the Einstein equations are violated here. So you just have a, a piece of Kluskal. But precisely because of a piece of Kluskal, you can take a piece that goes twice into itself. So this is, I think, a very beautiful technical result that shows that, wow, it is possible from the outside that a black hole evolves into a white hole, that an horizon, um, evol a, a, a trapping horizon evolves into a trapping horizon. Uh, so the classical part is, is okay. Um, what about the quantum part, this green uh, region? And the green region is really three different physical problems. Because there's a star, what happened to the star, there's a horizon, what happened to the horizon, and there's what happened here. And these are space-like separated phenomena Remember, I mean, just this is an intuition, but uh, for a so, uh, uh, solar mass black hole, the distance between the star and the, 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 what happened near the horizon, uh, on the surface when you enter the quantum gravity region is 10 to the 75 light years, yeah, far, far away. There's no, no signal that goes from one to the other. So these are three different physical problems. And you don't describe three different physical problems with a single equation, right? If you want to, do the physics so for your motorbike, you don't write one equation, right? One equation for the wheel, one for the carburetor, one for the... So these have to be studied separately and they hope to have a single equation making sense of all that, I think is too much, so far at least. So let's study the, the, the three regions separately. First, the C region, the star, and I just give you uh, the result, but just mentioning one recent paper, but this is a, uh, it's a, it's a, a it's an ongoing uh, effort of clarification. Um, this can be, what happened can be studied using loop quantum gravity because uh, the, the star itself, uh, uh, you just model it with a homogeneous um, uh, uh, sphere of matter, ball of matter that get compressed. Uh, you, do the, uh, you do the quantization and uh, sort of not surprising, it comes up the same equation that the Friedman equation corrected by loop quantum gravity. This is the uh, Friedman equation with the uh, last term, which is loop quantum gravity correction. Um, rho is the density. So when the density becomes Planckian, uh, uh, this, this gives to zero. So you get uh, zero in the derivative, you get a bounce. Okay. So what the star want to do is bounce. And the, 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 the bouncing moment of the star, it uh, has been called the Planck star. So the C reason, the, the, what happened here is that the star want to bounce. But how, where does it bounce through? Well, let's go to the A region. The A region, there is no star and no horizon. So it's basically uh, what happened quantum mechanically 
R equals zero um, in, 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 in a Kruska solution. It is an old idea, which has been studied and restudied and restudied zillions of time. In fact, as far as I, I, I trace back, the uh, uh, first time I found it is in the 50s by Singer, that in fact, the Einstein equation themselves are, can be naturally continued if you change variables, variables, not coordinates. And there's a way of continuing it from the, uh, the trapid to anti-trapid region of, uh, um, of the white hole. This has been done in loop quantum gravity a number of ways, again, using sort of uh, uh, loop quantum cosmology techniques, namely um, going to a reduced number of degrees, you know, sim a symmetri symmetric, uh, um, uh, uh, symmetric system where the number of degrees of freedom is small, and then you quantize it and see what happened. And what happened is that you go through. Uh, I'm not going to the, to the equation, I'm just telling you the result. There's a large, large number of literature uh, on that. How do you go through? Well, one way, of course, you go through a quantum transition, sort of a tunneling. But one way of viewing it is to, uh, to write a sort of uh, effective metric. This is effective metric with a parameter L, which is a um, has to do with Planck scale, of course. And uh, remember, uh, when you, when you, this is a foliation being used, uh, uh, R equal constant, each one of these uh, surfaces uh, is this tube. And when you go up toward the uh, um, singularity, the tube becomes longer and narrower. So what happened this metric is simply that it gets to some minimal value and then it bounces back, okay? It just, uh, uh, becomes long, 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 and then you you uh, you come back, and the curvature is zero uh, because the vacuum solution, except uh, it's almost zero, uh, L is small, uh, except in the uh, in 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 the transition itself. If you take this parameter to zero, you of course get to a singularity, okay? But it's a conical singularity. This is still a metric space. You can still do geodesic here and you just go through, you can still do quantum field theory on this metric space, and, and it's well-defined. You can do classical field theory and quantum field theory, right? On a cone, you can imagine that you can move, uh, you, can, you, you, know, you know what are straight lines on a cone, a double cone with a singularity. Good, so the actual uh, hard part is not the C region and the A region, is the B region, namely what happened at the horizon. Because here, there are less shortcuts. Here is really look quantum gravity in all its splendor somehow. It's hard to write or to guess an effective metric uh, there. And we don't need an effective metric, in fact. We just have a quantum transition. So let me tell you what is known from loop quantum gravity about this transition here. And this transition here, again, it's a, it's, it's a black hole horizon that becomes a white hole horizon. The trapping horizon behind the trapping horizon. And remember, it, it, you know, if you have talked about white holes in GR, from the outside, there's no dis distinction between black holes and white holes. The same, right? This region, the, the rightmost region of Cusco is, is, is outside the black hole, is also the outside of the white hole. So the, 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 the outside, nothing happens. That's the core, that's what allows this scenario to happen. But of course, the quantum region needs to leak out from the horizon a little bit because otherwise the horizon would, would go to infinity. That's what classical theory predict. So the transition here, it's really a, a, a quantum region where you see from the past coming in a, a, a trapping horizon and from future going in an anti-trapping horizon. How do you do we study that? Well, first of all, let me just put some parameters here. This is the, the kind of things we're interested in. The, the, just look at the outside solution of the Einstein equation, which I said is characterized by a certain number of parameters, the mass, of course, of the, of the star, the, um, the lifetime of the black hole, which is sort of M cubed, the, according to um, Hawking theory, the tunneling time itself, how long it takes to do that, and uh, these are the main parameters, and uh, the, the, the white hole lifetime. So the sort of the retarded time from the moment in which the transition to the moment where the, uh, uh, the white hole dissipates. A white hole can dissipate, right? Like a, a black hole can form. It's just white hole is time reversed all of them. And the, the, the lifetime of the uh, white hole doesn't need to be equal. Of course, the, 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 the process is not time symmetric uh, because there's dissipation. The, the Hawking radiation is dissipation, uh, dissipates, so the, the, the mass the, the area of the horizon becomes smaller, 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 and then remains small, okay? Uh, this, 
the relation between these parameters is not determined by the classical theory. It is the quantum stuff here. So what the quantum theory should tell us is the relation of this parameter. Namely, there should be probability amplitude, it's quantum theory, associated to any choice of these parameters, such that given one, you can compute the probability of other. So the problem of quantum gravity is to compute this function. It's a function of one, two, three uh, variables. This is, a, I'm, I'm skipping some details here. Um, four variables, and of course, G and H bar, which are the only uh, parameter uh, here. M is, it's also given, M, G, and H bar. All right, so uh, how do we compute that? Well, let me just uh, make uh, one, uh, um, one uh, slide summary of loop quantum gravity, just to, I, I expect very few of you to be familiar with loop quantum gravity. Well, I've seen in the audience, some people are very familiar with loop quantum gravity. So this is uh, loop quantum gravity in the covariant uh, version of it. Loop quantum gravity exists in a, um, a, a few versions. In, in, in one, of the, one of the formal instrument versions of the theory, which is uh, being uh, studied. Um, it's, uh, let me just stress one thing since there are some people who are more, perhaps more familiar to the uh, string way of doing uh, quantum gravity. Unlikely string theory, uh, loop quantum gravity is, is a well-defined theory. So these are the main equations. We know the main equations. You know, Polchinski used to say string theory is a wonderful theory. We don't know, it's a very simple uh, uh, basic equation. We don't know them. Uh, we do know them in loop quantum gravity. Maybe they're wrong. Maybe they don't describe it, but that's it. And, exist in more than one version, this is one. So there's a Hilbert space, there's a set of operators and there's some transition amplitudes which are given by some explicit formula ordered by order in some expansion. The formulas have some integrals of so SU2, SL to C. I'm, I'm not going to that. What I, what I wanna say is how do you use the for, this formula? Use this formula, um, I start from here. If this is a space-time uh, region, Okay, the blue here is a space-time region where a quantum gravity phenomenon happened. Um, you think that uh, you consider the boundary uh, between the region where the quantum gravity phenomenon happened and the outside where you can disregard quantum mechanics and you treat it as a, uh, the Heisenberg cut, the cut between the system and the apparatus, okay? So the state is on the boundary on a three-dimensional surface and the amplitude gives you the probability of this to happen or the amplitude for this to happen given a state of the bound. And in particular, outside this classical, you can take a semi-classical state. Uh, there's a big chapter of loop quantum gravity, which is the construction of semi-classical state, states that represent a given geometry uh, in the Hilbert space of the previous, uh, pre previous slide. So you apply that to the transition here by uh, selecting, choosing a surface surrounding the region uh, where quantum gravity phenomenon is. So you want it as small as possible, but not too small because uh, you want to be able to be, uh, to assume that outside it quantum effect can be disregarded. And uh, you know the geometry of that. How do you know the geometry of that? Well, because I told you, we know the, the, the solution of the classical equation of motion, the solution of Einstein equation outside. So the solution I, I equation is, is known. This is a local isomorphic to Kluskal. So the, the past part of this surface sigma uh, is, this, is this line here in, 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 in Kluskal. Uh, you have the parameters uh, that you're interested in. You just compute the intrinsic and extrinsic curvature of that. Um, this is the uh, intrinsic and extrinsic uh, uh, geometry, sorry, of the of the of the surface here, and then you you write a quantum state within a truncation. So essentially, you discretize this uh, three dimensional surface. You discretize the four dimensional region. Um, you discretize the geometry. You compute the uh, transition amplitude, and then you hope that there's uh, with a refined discretization this uh, converge. Uh, no proof of that, but there's a hope of that. Sort of what you do in, in lattice gauge theory. So this is a discretization of the three-dimensional surface, the four-dimensional surface, uh, and this is the actual uh, uh, interval that uh, is uh, uh, th that gives this transition amplitude here. Okay, it's a, it's complicated integral on S to C, and uh, uh, the 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 whole story is that uh, uh, we're struggling with this integral. We believe it's finite. 
not sure. Um, there's, I don't want to go into to, to, to the technicalities of, the, of this work. Uh, but this is what shows that, uh, first of all, this transition is possible. And second, it, it tells you when and where it's possible. And contrary to what, what we were hoping at the beginning, it seemed to be the first sort of naive approximation of this interval tells you that, uh, seems to tell you that, uh, in fact, um, as somebody might have expected, for this to happen, you need the horizon, uh, the incoming uh, black hole horizon to be small already. So this happened at the end of the operation black hole. We were hoping somehow to, to, to say, look, look quantum gravity predict this can happen when the black hole is large, but it's not coming out. So what's coming out is that uh, the transition, the tunneling can happen when the black hole, the, the horizon is small. Um, so this is the scenario. Now I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of the te technicalities. I just wanted to give you a sense of what is uh, going on. This is the scenario. Um, the, the, the inside of the black hole is this long tube that uh, here it starts growing and, and, and squeezing and it comes back. It starts uh, 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 decreasing in length and increasing in um, size of the, of the spheres. Um, and after the transition, what is here, it's, you're, you're essentially back in classical general relativity uh, up to some detail, which I'll say in a moment. How long is this phase going to last? Well, uh, this, is a, this is delicate. Um, let me, how am I doing with time? Well, maybe I can take a minute for that because I'm, I'm very close to the end. Um, let me... Uh, Let's follow what happened to energy and what happened to information. Energy at the beginning is all in the star. Then there's Hawking radiation that takes out energy. Okay, so the mass of the black hole shrinks. Uh, the uh, Hawking radiation has a negative energy component that falls in, and that's what takes away the energy of, of the horizon. The negative energy falls in the star, reaches the star, and eats away the energy of the star, right? So what comes out from the white hole, of course, is uh, little energy. So it's, it's the full the star, but with a positive energy star, the negative energy of the Hawking radiation, which more or less is similar. So very little energy is there. And that's obvious because a small white hole has a small mass. So the ADM energy is small. So the energy is small in, in all reasonable sense of all, all, all of the many reasonable sense of energy. So the path of the energy, if you want, it, it goes in, it, it goes out, if you want, with a backtracking the negative energy of the Hawking radiation and, and, and up here at, the, at infinity bef before the, the, the transition. What about information? Information, no. Information goes in and, 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 and information doesn't come back in time. And energy come in the sense that for, you have positive negative energy going, going ahead in time in quantum field theory. But information is inside, and so information has to come out. And information can come out because uh, this, uh, uh, this very long, huge volume inside can store all information we want with low energy, and, uh, uh, but you need a long time for it coming out. You just do whatever simple model system that you want, and you find out that uh, <clears throat> to have a small throat from which a large amount of information comes out and you only have little energy to deal with, uh, uh, you need a very long uh, time. This in fact was figured out uh, long ago and, and, and it matches with what comes out of here. So if M cube is the Hawking duration lifetime of the white hole, M4 is much, much longer, is the likely um, duration of the remnant. So you have a remnant, which is uh, uh, Planckian, in area and therefore in mass and very, very long living. Now, as I said, remnants were studied in the past. Uh, uh, you know, in the 80s, people talked about remnants after the end of the operation and they discarded them. Why? Well, they discarded it for three reasons, um, three questions. First, what the hell they are. Second, uh, why they're stable. There's the, the, the reasons for instability and white holes are known to be unstable. And third, if a remnant uh, has to do what this scenario predicts, namely have to have little energy and a lot of information, it has a lot of large number of states with little energy. So why are they not produced at CERN in great numbers? Because uh, a large number 
of states means a huge phase space in the, in the calculation of the transition amplitudes. So the probability of producing them should, should go up uh, enormously. So that's where the three arguments, um, Steve Giddings, for instance, at the time, um, for discarding these things. The arguments are good, but they don't apply in that case. Why? First of all, what are remnants? Uh, well, here they are. They are I mean, it's a, it's a classical solution for Einstein equation. Right? It's the white hole. It's perfectly, um, it's a small, teeny thing, uh, a microgram, five microgram, what is a Planck mass? Um, and classical physics predict these things to exist. And if this is very long, it takes a lot of time to come, uh, come out. Um, so we have a very good model of that. <clears throat> Second, why are they stable? Well, White holes are unstable, of course, and this is well understood, the, the sense of the instability of the white hole. But what does it mean that they're unstable? It means that there's a finite probability, which you can estimate thermodynamically, so there's this instability, uh, to become a black hole. So once you're here, look at the physics of the horizon here, this might becomes a black hole, but a black hole is just a black hole, um, a small black hole, Planck and black hole, can become a white hole. So you have a two-way process. And how do you describe that? We know how to describe that in quantum theory because the black to white transition, it's a quantum transition. So let's just uh, have a two-state, two-level two system, black and white. And we have the, so the probability amplitude of the transition of one to the other and the, uh, the, uh, the energy one to the other. And we know what happens. The system stabilizes on the minimum energy. So quantum gravity, Quantum mechanics, naive quantum mechanics, predicts that uh, uh, the, uh, the instability is compensated by the fact that the, the, the black hole goes back to the, 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 the... There's no way to go, these things, except for these two uh, bottom states, right? Um, so what quantum mechanics predicts is that this stays on a state which is a linear combination of black and white, if you want. That's why I said it's not exactly classical theory out there because quantum theory comes in, uh, it's like the same phenomenon to stabilize an atom, right? Uh, so you have this uh, uh, Planck size and, and careful here, uh, well, I'll come back to that. Um, uh, microgram objects, which are stable uh, and very long living. And I already wrote that, Marty, it was very tempting to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. You're saying that it's a, it's a promoter black hole. There's plenty of little things which only interact gravitationally. Uh, it's sort of powder. Uh, could this be a component of dark matter? Well, this is being explored by some people with some problems and some, some, some possibilities. So I'm not going to that. Now, let me come to the main argument that had uh, people abandoned the idea of uh, remnants uh, sort of 50 years ago, which is the, the large phase space and uh, um, why are they not produced at CERN? And, uh, and this is a clear cut solution here. Uh, first of all, it's not a rigorous argument, right? Because uh, uh, it's like saying an integral over an infinite domain necessarily is infinite. Well, no. I mean, an, infinite, an integral of infinite domains is not necessarily infinite, uh, because there are, there, there, there are functions which are integrable at infinity, obviously. Uh, the point is that whether the, the function depend on, 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 on the variable that goes to uh, infinity. So the point is where the production probability depend on the quantum numbers uh, uh, that, that, that label the large number of states and how. And what are the quantum number that uh, uh, label this large tail of possible states were essentially the, the volume inside. So what about the probability of producing a black hole at CERN with a huge volume inside? Well, we know what it is because it's, we have the classical limit of it, right? The, and, and we know that to produce a, a very long volume inside, you need an enormous amount of time, which means that the probability is very low. To quantum mechanical. So um, the remnants are not uh, Planckian things uh, which sort of there um, have an almost number of st states easily accessible. They have uh, locality protect them 
because uh, the, 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 the large number of states correspond to uh, white hole bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, which are very difficult to, I mean, you can tunnel to that, but the, probably the amplitude is enormously suppressed, as is shown by uh, classical theory that says that to produce a large volume, you, you need a huge amount of time. All right. So I just uh, said that I was going to flash. Oh, I took I talked for longer than I thought. Uh, phenomenology. So I just mentioned that there is an attempt to explore the relevance of that as uh, uh, a possible candidate of dark matter from primordial black hole, from three bounce black holes. Um, I just flash a few transparencies. So my last two slides. First, I want to repeat that uh, unitary uh, evolution. Uh, Infinity and the equivalence principle are compatible. The, the mistake in thinking that they are not compatible is to sort of assume there is an event horizon, assume that the thermodynamical entropy bounds of von Neumann entropy, uh, assume that the state that you compute in a stationary approximation uh, include the non-stationary interior real physics that happen inside there, you know, black hole, the interior black hole can be as big as the solar system, much more. I mean, I mean, millions of times, this is the full area of the solar system. The idea that inside there, there is no state, it's just... Um... Now, this doesn't contradict, uh, nowadays people, you know, to, to, to derive the Planck, the page curve, uh, which is required if, uh, if the phenomenon entropy uh, is bounded by the baking the hawking entropy, uh, find very curious, maybe interesting properties of gravity, but that has nothing to do with the, with the story, I think. So I think that uh, it is a, an assumption of a too strong version of holography, uh, which confuses, is confusing the current, a lot of current debate about uh, what happened to black hole. So there is a viable scenario for unitarity, um, black hole evolution, compatible with quantum field theory, and compatible with the string calculation of how many states there are, provided that you interpret this correctly. So that's my summary. So that's the scenario. Uh, there's no contradiction between unitarity uh, and uh, uh, quantum field theory on curved space time. Uh, quantum field theory goes wrong, of course, but only in the quantum gravity region, where the curvature becomes uh, Planckian. And this happened outside the horizon, that's the point, at the end of the evaporation. There are no event horizon. Um, there are, uh, the, 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 the sky of black hole requires a non-stationary uh, state. There are three distinct regions where, um, that have to be analyzed. So it's very hard to analyze them together, the matter. And the loop quantum gravity indi indication is a matter bounds. The, 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 through, through the singularity, through the classical, would be classical singularity, which just takes a, a, a trapped uh, region into an anti-trapped region, just a quantum jump. And uh, the, uh, the quantum tunneling of the horizon from sort of uh, black to white, all this can be studied with loop quantum gravity techniques, with different loop quantum gravity techniques. Uh, there's a, I just mentioned there is a possible reach for physical phenomenology, which I said almost nothing about. And uh, remember, black hole is a long, huge tube that becomes longer and longer until the single act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlo. Um, so yeah, there is lots of time for question. Yeah, and I'm open to question. I know that a lot of what I said contradict uh, things given for granted in uh, a good part of the contemporary literature on black holes. So I'm happy to uh, discuss that at, at, at at, at length and, and listen all country opinions. Okay. There was first a question from Deepak. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. Uh, nice talk, Carla. Thank um, you. So uh, I guess, I, guess um, I have a conceptual uh, difficulty in understanding this. How can the interior uh, of a black hole grow to a size that is much larger than the size of the visible universe? Uh, you know, like doesn't compute. <laughs> so can you yeah. explain that? Yeah. Um, yeah, 
I can easily. Uh, let me try this way. Why shouldn't it? What is it in your opinion that forbids that to happen? Well, the number of degrees of freedom, like all of that information, if you're saying that that whole volume, that huge volume of space time with the distances of 10 to the 75 light years separating points, right? Uh, so, so that will have a massive number of degrees of freedom, right? Ah, no, 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 so, no, no, sorry. Uh, that's just a very long, narrow thing. So the volume is not that length to the cube. The volume is that length uh, times something which I, 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 I could try to, I, I could recover easily. Um, the volume uh, goes like the mass to the fifth, I think, I don't, I don't remember. So the number of degrees of freedom uh, roughly it's the uh, the Bekesi Hawking entropy of the original black hole, mm -hmm. of, of, of the where it comes from. So the number of mm -hmm. degrees of freedom it's small compared to the to the to the whole number of degrees of freedom of the of the universe. It's the number of degrees of freedom of the star that of everything mm -hmm. they fall in essentially. But then, in what sense do you, do we say that the volume is getting bigger? I just general relativity. It's a, a calculation of classical general relativity. No, no. So I'm, I'm, I'm not because making when I think in terms of loop quantum gravity, right? I mean, I think of volume. No, no, no this, is not, this is a classical theory. I'm not, I'm not going into quantum mechanics here. It's a, the volume is bigger. It's an it's a unquestionable result in classical GR. Okay? So um, this, is a, this is a classical um, charge solution. Charge, I mean, in interior, including the interior, right? So the so it's a Finkelstein coordinate, so or a piece of Kruskal with a star, and you just cut away the part where uh, the curvature becomes uh, a Planckian. So that's quantum mechanics. That's quantum gravity for sure. So just cut, cut away. Just look at the last um, uh, at the surface here. Uh, where are the curvature? It's a bit less than Planck, okay? A computed volume. Just an exercise. You can give it to your student in the general relativity class. Uh, even better, I'll try to do it myself. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think it's, uh, uh, but, but look, it's here. The, the, this is, a, this is a, um, a short solution, right? This is also valid inside. Mm -hmm. uh, fix a value of R. So you have dr equals zero, just get the first and the last term. And, and that's the metric of the surface here, of a, essentially of a surface of, a, of constant r, right? Mm -hmm. When r grows, so when you go to one surface to the other, the, this is a sphere which becomes smaller and smaller. And this is the line element in the axial direction, which becomes larger and larger. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are a few details to be completed here. So you get this tube that, and uh, if you wait for a time m cube, which is the Hawking radiation time, until the, this is a, the 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 throat here has shrunk, mm -hmm. but the interior essentially is that. Mm -hmm. So um, this uh, the volume is is that if you define the volume, you can in, in Minkowski space you can define the volume inside a sphere as the, um, the largest surface, of course, not the smallest, the la because if you move, uh, it, becomes, it becomes less if you, if you go light, like, of course, the largest um, surface uh, bounded by that sphere. So you define the volume the same way, and then uh, you just compute the volume and you get this number here. It is in these references here, if you, if you want to look sure. at the reference, how big is the black oh, hole? Yeah, yeah. And, then there, and then there is a number of papers later that have done this in all sorts of version and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. We have a next question from Shravan. Shravan Kumar, ask, please ask your question. Hi, Shravan. Hi, hi Carlo. Uh, probably I missed uh, in one of your slides. You have a comment about dark matter. Can, can you, Explain it because I'm I'm asking this question in the context of like if they're primordial black holes, they can act as a dark matter, which is a scenario which is quite uh, popular now. So I mean, if 
Yeah, according to your proposal, if these primordial black holes evaporate, there will be remnants white holes. How they act as dark matter? How they are different from the standard uh, scenario? I mean, observationally. Um, well, yeah, uh, black holes are, are becoming popular uh, as dark matter candidates, and I'm very happy. I, I, I always hoped that black holes. I, I love the. And this is just emotional, it's not really rational. Um, the possibility that dark matter is black holes, because it's, a, it's the only hypothesis for dark matter I know that doesn't require new physics. Okay? In a sense, this I've given is not new physics. It's just general relativity and, uh, and, and quantum mechanics. I mean, provided we know how to put them together. Now, um, black holes could be component dark matter in different manners. They could be big black holes, small black holes, very small black holes. Uh, these ones I'm talking about are uh, 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 Planck mass, which means a microgram. And they're not really black holes. It's, it's, uh, it's what remains of the black hole after the end of the evaporation. So first of all, what kind of dark matter would that be? Let, let me separate it because there, there are two different questions. The answers one is very good. The answer, the answer of the other is a lot of question marks and pro possible problems. So first one, um, this would be little uh, things of a microgram, so uh, uh, the weight of my hair, um, uh, which only interact gravitationally and uh, uh, not in any other ways. So it's a perfect component for cold or almost cold uh, uh, dark matter. So they could be... It's perfect theoretically. It's uh, the problem is that if, if dark matter is that, how do we check that it is that? Because it doesn't decay like the neutralino. It doesn't. Uh, uh, it doesn't have. A, it, it's exactly what what the astrophysicists would like to say. I mean, there's this just this powder going there, which uh, doesn't interact electromagnetically nor in any other way. Um, now, is that plausible? Well, it, to make it plausible, you have to. To see where where this came from, where 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 these black holes were produced, and uh, and uh, they had to evaporate before before becoming remnants, and then evaporating, they are throwing energy into the into the universe. Uh, so, is this compatible with the standard cosmology with nuclear synthesis and 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 so on and so forth? And uh, here there are two two options. One is to think that they are primordial, so they were formed. Uh, um, early, I, I want I, I I don't want to go in, into details, and uh, and as far as I know, I'm not. This is not my field. Uh, that's not easy to fit the production, and uh, so so you have to choose when they could be formed and uh, what was the initial mass, because whatever is the initial mass, they can they end up Planckian, and to um, to balance energy and everything with a, with the current cosmological scenario. And uh, I, I've seen papers who say that this, is, this doesn't work. Um, but I'm not competent enough to, 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 to see what all the possibilities are. The other possibility, which is, it requires to be more speculative, is that there is a bounce. So the Big Bang is a bounce, which is another popular idea now. And uh, the remnants went through the bounce. I think this is super interesting. It's the, 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 the weakness of that is it requires more speculations. Uh, but uh, uh, and then this also has to be explored. Uh, um, so it's, I see this as an open problem. I, I think it's an interesting possibility to be explored. So it's perfect as a candidate, but to reconstruct the full story of where they come from, it's, it's a lot of questions that I have not seen convincing answers so far. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, when you say white hole, I mean, is it just it can, remnant can be white hole, right? That's what, that's what I was saying. Yeah, that's correct. And it cannot be dark matter. Is it? No, it can be dark matter. It can be. So <laughs> this is. Actually, it's a perfect candidate. A white hole is a per a Planck sized black hole is a perfect kind. If the universe was created today, that would be perfect. If you don't have to worry about how we got there, that would be a perfect candidate for dark matter. Okay. Then, then my question is how to distinguish a dark matter candidate, which is black hole and white hole. 
see uh, there can be different sizes of primordial black holes which are produced and which are not ah. came to the evaporation or came to the uh, white hole tra transition stage so you can have white hole as dark matter or black hole stage as dark matter so in that sense uh, if we have these two how to distinguish observation ah um a uh, good question um uh the, the only way to distinguish a black hole from a white hole uh, from the outside is to wait so if you just have a if i have here next to me a white hole and a black hole the same mass uh, uh they're the same uh there's nothing you can do from the outside to distinguish them uh, they, 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 they're attractive. Uh, you can be orbitating around it. They, they're just two masses. Uh, but if you wait long enough, uh, the, the black hole produces Hawking radiation and shrinks, uh, the white hole uh, emits stuff and uh, uh, disappears. Uh, so the, 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 uh, on, on, on dynamically, on the longer term, they, 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 become, they become different. Um, the... Uh, if you have a, a small planck size black holes uh, in the sky in large numbers, uh, they, they emit Hawking radiation and they die uh, pretty soon. So if dark matter is made by larger black holes, so larger than a microgram, if you have a, you know, one kilogram or uh, uh, one ton black holes, uh, out there, this has nothing to do with the story I told. It's a different possibility. How do we distinguish between the two? I don't know. Okay, I mean, this is up to the astrophysicists to find out whether there is one tone things out there or not. Um, if they're small, uh, then, uh, the, uh, so if, if this is a microgram kind of things, Planckian kind of things, then uh, the black holes are bound to end their evaporation, and uh, do they disappear? Well, the message I'm bringing here is no, they don't disappear. They just stay there as remnant uh, little. Um, so you have a much longer, extremely long lifetime for a black hole to stay there. So for instance, if the black hole was, uh, suppose you buy the bounce thing, uh, bounce cosmology. If the black hole was formed in the previous uh, phase, and if it can go through the bounds, they just stay there. And, uh, and, and, and they could be, dark matter could be that. So it's not so different from a black hole story, but it's different. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, the next question is from Igor Vavoyevich. Igor, please ask your question. Thank you, Carl, for the nice talk. You consider you. the end of the evaporation. Now, the Hawking temperature is inverse proportional to the mass of black hole. So in the end of evaporation, it goes to infinity. The same with ah, good. of energy. Good. What Very good. This? Very good. Very good. Thank you. That's exactly, yeah, that's, that's a good way of, pu of putting the, 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 the motivation of, 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 of what, I, what I've done. Um, thank you for this question. Uh, in fact, maybe I should have said that. Um, uh, this is a relevant slide. If you take general relativity, classical general relativity, uh, and quantum field theory um, on, a, on, 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 on the classical background, uh, and you sort of uh, think that the back reaction is what is reasonable to expect, um, then uh, you get uh, a, a singularity inside and outside you get this um, infinite temperature at, in the moment of the end of the evaporation, exactly as you said. But of course, that's a prediction which disregards quantum gravity because uh, before getting to uh, infinite temperature, the outside of the black hole uh, has a curvature which is Planckian, so you enter in a quantum gravity regime. So therefore, the, uh, that prediction is not reliable, and there should be something quantum gravitational that happens before that, right? So as usual, uh, there's an infinity, and quantum mechanics 
the, the reason there's infinity is because it's not because in, in, in the in, in the reality there's infinity, is that we are uh, wrongly taking h bar to zero. Okay, h bar is not zero. So before the temperature going to infinity, something happened. And what does it happen? That's the question. Well, uh, that's exactly the calculation that uh, um, that uh, uh, we're doing. Because uh, if we are computing, I'm looking for the, the right slide here. Um, if we are computing, uh, yeah. If you're computing the transition, the quantum transition here, we're cutting, we're exactly cutting away the, the, the part where the temperature is infinite. So um, the, the infinite temperature is replaced, the, the, the moment of infinite temperature is replaced by a quantum transition with something happened. What does it happen? Uh, the, 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 the trapping horizon does not go to zero because to get infinite temperature, you have to go to zero. But there's no infinitely small horizon in quantum gravity because uh, loop quantum gravity predicts a discrete um, Space time. So there isn't an arbitrary small. There's, there's no black hole smaller than a Planck size, and there's a white hole smaller than Planck size. So when you come here, what happened? Well, there's a quantum transition to a, to a white hole. So there's no infinite temperature. Um, there's, of course, the, the last Hawking explosion, because unless the transition happened too fast, the, the last moment of the Hawking radiation is still strong, uh, but it's finite. And uh, the black hole remains. Uh, the, 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 the hole remains at the Planckian size uh, and, it, and it doesn't emit after because uh, uh, a white hole does not emit a, a Hawking radiation. I hope this did, is... Did is, you get right. a formula for the modified temperature? No, the only thing, no, that's one of the thing. Uh, so the, the, one of the, the calculations you give is when, uh, up to when the, 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 the non-quantum uh, no quantum gravity result is reliable. And as I said, uh, uh, we don't have full control of that integral yet. I uh, hope we will. <laughs> um, what we see is that uh, uh, the probability of the transition becomes uh, for order one uh, near the Planckian uh, transition. But I, I can, this is sort of order, order of magnitude is not, is not a calculation. It's a real okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is from Rifah Khan. Please ask your questions. Hi, Carlo. Uh, Hi. Thanks for, the, thanks for the talk. I have two questions before which I would like to make sure I understood the picture correctly. So okay. the, the gray uh, shaded region that you have below the orange dot, that's the infalling star. And what exactly is the gray shaded region that you have above the or orange dot? Um, yeah, yeah, you, you understand correctly that the gray region is the falling star. The star itself bounces and uh, is still the star. Uh, okay. It's the, the star that has gone after the, the bounce and mm -hmm. is sort of exp expanding out. Now it can expand because the outside metric is not any more trapped. There's a white hole, so you can, you can, you can come out in a white hole. Um, careful, some of the Hawking radiation falls inside it's negative energy and uh, get to that star. So in this, before coming out, the star absorbs the negative energy of the Hawking radiation, so its own energy goes down. Okay. So in the last point uh, in which this uh, star exits the white hole in that uh, yeah. yeah that region, by that time, the entire star would have been eaten up by the negative energy of Hawking radiation. Is it like that? Yeah, all its energy, it's all, all or almost all its energy. All I mean, the, 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 yeah, it's uh, okay. the, the macroscopic okay. part of its energy has been eaten up. At the okay, that That's actually great. answered my second question. So, and uh, my first question was like, so there is this uh, uh, green, I don't know what color that, yeah, that shaded region with B. And so that yeah. is where quantum gravity effects is important. And then yeah. there is also this line connecting that to this uh, yeah. orange dot. Is th that is also a place where quantum gravity effects are important, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. So, so let's say I, uh, I take a slice below that uh, line and yeah. that slice has the information about the star and yeah. I take a slice above that line. Yeah. Now, uh, above that line also, uh, the slice would have some QFT state. So what yeah. tells me 
uh, that that QFT state above the line is uh, correlated with the QFT state below the, below the line because uh, it passes through uh, a region where uh, QFT breaks down. Uh, good. So very good. So um, very good. So this is a this is a great question, and uh, uh, if we could uh, if we could uh, solve it entirely and precisely, it would be better. Uh, we cannot solve it entirely and precisely. We have bits of a solution which seems to be um, convergent. So one thing we could do is uh, to um, have the quantum gravity calculation and see uh, the transition, uh, see the transition, and then uh, compute effective metric also in the quantum region, consider it as a background and see how uh, matter evolves over it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this uh, this is, has been done. This is uh, it's pretty easy. In fact, uh, uh, you can both evolve uh, particle trajectories to the mm -hmm. geodesic. You can do classical field theory through, and you can do quantum field theory through. Okay, mm -hmm. it's you just uh, uh, you're just on a on a manifold which, uh, for a short while, does not respect Einstein equations, but it's still normal Lorentz manifold. So. Nobody said that to do quantum field theory that you should be on a manifold that respect nice equation. Now, this is an approximation, but uh, I think it, it's reliable enough to say, all right, so we know what matters uh, does going through the, um, the quantum bounds. Now, there's a little bit more that has, has been studied because the actual dynamic of the star, uh, right now people are trying to, to do using loop quantum gravity to evolve it through the, through the classical bounds. But I think it's preliminary. I'm not sure I'm convinced by those calculations yet. Okay. Because I would think if uh, you, you go from a slice below that line and yeah. to a slice above the line, since it passed through a quantum gravity process, the state above the line uh, would actually also be a superposition of different metrics. Now, and in each of that branch, you may have a QFT state and the information about the QFT state below that line would be completely uh, gone into all of the different branches and may not be present in a single branch uh, about that line. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. And, uh, uh, and if you maybe collectively look at all of these branches, then probably the infalling Hawking radiation or something could happen. I don't know. Yeah, just thinking out loud. Um, I think it's extremely, an extremely good point. So what you're saying, let, let me rephrase what you're saying. And you, you don't need to, to do it precisely and locally through this green line here. You can consider mm. the full transition here. Yeah. What you're saying is, let, is, let me try to rephrase it. Look, Carlo, what you're really doing is, uh, let's use a Copenhagen language here instead mm. of uh, this language. What you're really doing is that you know the universe prepares a state and then it measures it in the past, in the in, in the in, 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 in the in, in, in the future of the of the transition region. So what you've done is actually you know uh, set up a preparation of quantum state and then make a measurement, okay, and then continue classically. And of course, in in in, in preparing a state, you make a measurement. There's information loss. There's a measurement, right? Yeah. So why why isn't there uh, information loss there? Uh, uh, great question. I don't have an answer. Maybe there is. I don't know. So maybe... Maybe, maybe there the... is information loss for each of those branches, but there is no information loss when you uh, uh, take all of those branches collectively, and that can only be observed by an observer who is outside that region. Oh, definitely, yes. Oh, def that's, that's definitely for sure. Um, that's definitely for sure. That's what we expect. I mean, it, if I... If I measure spin in the z direction and then I measure spin in the x direction, I, well, I lose information. I, I lose information about the previous one. But uh, but of course, uh, if I make the experiment many many times and I consider all possible outcomes, I'm not losing information. So the state, the full state, is not the outcome of the measurement. It's uh, it's before the outcome of the measurement. So. Um, is there a, a spread in the in 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 the future, uh, and, and does the spread goes to um, different geometries? 
I think this is a great question. This is really the kind of physics one should explore. And how much is that information loss compared to the brutal information loss that you have uh, if whatever falls into the horizon, you know, needs some funny things to come out or, or, or is lost. Cool. So uh, very, very good questions. And I don't, I don't have a clear answer. Thank you. Okay. The next question is from Alba Aronsa. Alba, please ask your question. Uh, hi, thanks for your talk. Very interesting. Um, hi, Alba. I have a question. Hi, I have a question about horizons. Uh, so if we should be thinking of black hole horizons as trapping horizons. Um, how should we define this in more general space times where we don't have a, a preferred foliation, like here where we have a spherical symmetric foliation? Oh yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've. I mean, everything I've I, I've said has sort of stayed in spherical symmetry when everything is, everything is easy and and the notion of trapping it's 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 very easy. The 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 quasi local horizons have been defined in general relativity in great details in a in in a general uh, case with a name that go uh, apparent apparent horizon, dynamical horizons. Um, these are all definition. These are all technical definitions that have to do with what happened to the geometry in a finite region around um, the horizon itself, um, or, or, or around the uh, regional space time, and uh, th they all converge in the in the case of Schwarzschild. They are all um, sort of intuitively quite similar. They're, they're all very precise. And uh, uh, the most general one, which I think is the dynamical horizon, uh, it's it's uh, it, it's hold for shaking things, non-symmetric things. Uh, so there is a there is a way there is a technical way of saying the same thing, which I said uh, also outside sort of spherical symmetry. You can look at the I don't know, uh, for instance, Ashtekar has worked more on the general definition of dynamical horizons. The, intu the general intuition is simple, right? I mean, it's a, an event horizon is something you cannot come out forever. So once you're in, you, you, you cannot go to infinity anymore. But then there is a much more um, physically interesting notion, which is that you have an horizon, it's a sphere, for which for a while you could, cannot, come, cannot come out, but maybe yes in the future. And that can be made precise. Right, so from the, the focusing of, of light rays in the expansion yeah. scalar. Yeah. So, but that depends on your foliation, right? You could pick a foliation if you're a little perverse where the apparent horizon is at a point. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that. Similarity. No, no. What I'm saying is that there are definitions that don't depend on the foliation. Okay, thank you. Okay. The, the dynamic horizon definition does not depend on the foliation. So then. Okay, the next question is from Ali Q. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlo, for the nice talk. Um, sorry for the noise around okay. me because I'm in, a, in the train station. Uh, okay. So uh, are you actually saying that uh, a Planck mass object can carry a boundless amount of information? Yes. For example, I can take, okay. And is this consistent with the uh, with, uh, discrete uh, picture of the world? Like uh, if there is a, if there is a, for example, a quanta of lowest possible energy, uh, would that still keep it possible? Yes, uh, the answer is yes. Um... Uh, the, the energy by itself does not bound information. Okay. So, um, so. The, what bounds information is energy times something else. I mean, uh, in fact, that's the reason uh, we expect the white, hole to, the, the white hole to be very long living. Because uh, if, if you want to go, this information to come out from from a small sphere uh, and you don't have energy enough um, then, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's true. I mean, I can't define it. Imagine I have a system which has a, 
uh, you know, energy levels and as a quantum number, which is independent from the energy and can go from one to infinity. Well, here it's, yeah. it's easy to define yeah. it. Okay. Okay. Uh, but if I have a one, one quantum of energy, uh, which is the lowest possible one, uh, can that carry energy in any possible, in any, in any way? Okay, can that carry information more than just a, a, a bit or a qubit? Uh, well, if you have one quantum mm. without further quantum numbers, uh, you just have one bit. Yeah. If you only have one, one single quantum yeah. which doesn't have any other quantum number, it's it just either is there or is not there. Okay. But if this single quantum has a quantum or, number that can go from one to five, you have log five information. Yeah, yeah. So the answer is yes. You can, you can, you, you, a single quantum can have, um, uh, you know, information is it's a tricky thing. It's, not, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, how many possibility can it be in? Yeah, yeah. So, so just let me formulate it in, 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 in another way and that would be my last uh, question. So uh, if I take a billion billion of, of, those, uh, of those remnants uh, and then merge them into one black hole and then let it evaporate and then that one single remnant which, which remains will carry as much information as was in the billion billion of it, right? That's correct. And then, That's I, can point. Do, and, and That's then point. I can keep doing this a uh, hundred billion billion times. And then that little yeah. thing left at the end will carry the information in the whole thing. That's correct. That's okay. correct. Yeah. Okay. That's correct. Which you can do the same thing. Um, you can do the same thing classically, right? You can, um, even without going to, uh, to, to, to white holes. You, you can take two, mm -hmm. two, two black holes, have them merge and, and wait until they shrink <laughs> and then merge more and then wait and then more and wait. And so you, 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 you get, you can get more and more things. Uh, you, you can get things which from the outside look the same, but from the inside are, are, are more and more different. And as long as these are black holes for you, that information is lost or it's, but but it's, you know that's that's classic. quite different right because if i take many black holes and merge them into one black hole and let wait until they evaporate so there are two different pictures i either uh, believe that information will gradually uh dissipate. leak out uh, yeah. yeah right leak out during the evaporation process yeah and, and this is and what a lot of people apply. is exploring yeah. Right. yeah and then that doesn't apply but if i only if i believe that the, all the information will come out at the end then what you're what you're saying does apply. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people nowadays are explored. Some of the, a lot of people got convinced uh, that, as you say, small things cannot have large information. And on the basis of that, they, they, a lot of people got convinced that it has to leak out. So all sorts of mechanisms are being invented uh, for, for, for allowing information to leak out and then the page curve to go down. So the, the, the phenomenon entropy to decrease right. the second part of the life of the black hole. Um, oh. I, I think they're, they attempt to solve a problem which is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I would like to discuss this point more, but maybe I, I leave time for other people. To... Don't, 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 don't miss the train. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, the next questions. I see one more question from Victoria Porzova. Victoria, please ask your question. Please. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I apologize. I wasn't present the whole lecture, but I have a question which I would like to ask you as a quantum gravity expert. It's probably a bit out of this uh, topic, but still related. I was thinking about it and we discussed with my mathematician, friend mathematician. Can be Keller geometry helpful in our understanding of quantization of space-time? And if yes, um, how do you see it? Because they normally work on Riemannian, Riemannian, with Riemannian geometry and our space-time is pseudo-Riemannian, so. This is my question. 
Yeah, which which geometry you refer to? There was a Keller, Keller, a Keller, Keller geometry. Um, it looks like mostly mathematicians work on it. Not sure that actually physicists, I mean theoretical physicists, work on it, but like mathematicians. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> look, I, I I don't want to. I don't want to give a negative opinion on research directions, which are not mine, <laughs> but you ask mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. And uh, uh, I don't think that the problem of quantum gravity has anything to do with uh, uh, the specific version of uh, or extension of the Riemannian geometry that one considers in, 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 uh, in, sort of in a classical description. Um, you know, Maxwell equations describe the electromagnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a certain, you can present Maxwell equation geometrically on, on, on a manifold and, uh, you know, you have fiber bands. But the quantization of Maxwell has nothing to do with changing the formulation of the classical theory. Uh, classical theory is correct. It is what it is. It's very good. I mean, we can study alternative formulation or maybe it's wrong, but but yeah, I know. We, I, I'm, we need... I'm a theoretical physicist myself, a PhD in it, so I know Maxwell equations. Okay, so okay. So we 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 are motivated to change the physics if we have experiments. We don't have experiments. What we we, we don't have experiments that indicate that current various equivalent formulation of Einstein theory are wrong. Uh, what we need is to find the quantum properties. The quantum properties have nothing to do with a more complicated geometry. It's a completely different story. Quantum, quantum gravity, there's no manifold, there's no geometry, there are transition amplitudes, there are Hilbert spaces, there are states. Uh, it's like quantum electromagnetism. There are states, there are transition amplitudes. It's not yes, more I know complicated. About this. So I I would say uh, I, I would not be I would not be hopeful of that line of investigation to contribute to quantum gravity. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, um, I, I may... see one more question from Richard Kerner. Richard, please ask yeah. me. Hello, thank you, Carla, hey, for a nice talk. Thank I, you. I, it's, it's not really relevant, but I wanted to share some something that made me always uneasy because when, whenever speaking about quantum gravity, we compare three constants, H, C, and G. And when you look at it, uh, the precision at which H and C are known is about many, many orders of magnitude more precise than G. And I think there is no, no hope whatsoever that we will know G to that precision. And somehow I feel uneasy about it, don't you? Um... This is the question. <laughs> um, well, no, no, if, if it doesn't matter, just that you tell that it makes no, no problem. I mean, okay. Let For me, me I... let me, th let me think. Um, first of all, you, you, you're obviously right. I mean, we know we, we have a. Uh, we you know how, how many say... orders of magnitude? How many precision, for example, for H? If if you change. One in ten billion, the consequences will be immediately felt in quantum physics. Um, uh, right. So uh, the fact that we don't know with sufficient precision g, which is a fact, I agree. Um, and uh, in fact, we we haven't we have, we have not, any access to it. With such a precision, I can't imagine how. I'm sorry. What did you say? I can't even imagine how we could make this precision like the precision with C or H. Oh, don't, don't, don't miss. Uh, um, uh, I mean, be, 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 have trust in experiment experimentalists. They come out maybe, with maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and nowadays they are. 
do interfere quantum interference ex- things with things involved gravity. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if the precision increases. Mm. But that's but but that, your question is different. Uh, does this bother me? Of course, bother me. I, I wish we we knew that better. But does it bother this with respect to the problem of quantum gravity? I don't think so because what 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 the lack of precision in the measurement of G means is that uh, uh, as far as we've measured the universe, is, what we have measured is compatible with different values of G. All right. Whatever is this actual value of G, we have a quantum problem of quantum gravity. It's not that for some value of G, we would have more, some values G would have less. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. So uh, whatever it is, uh, there is a problem, which is to understand the quantum property of space-time or the quantum property of gravity. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the research of quantum gravity theoretically is not much affected. Now, in the moment in which we come out with uh, experiments of quantum gravity, and there are nice ones which have been prepared even in the laboratory recently, there were beautiful ideas of how to do quantum gravity experiments in the laboratory. Perhaps the... Um, the lack of precision we have in uh, in, in in knowledge will will come out, but I haven't seen any situation in which uh, it has affected uh, neither theory nor experiments so far. Okay, thanks. Okay. Well, I think we have uh, already a lot of questions, a lot of big discussions. Let's thank Carla for a very interesting talk and very stimulating. Okay, thank you very much for your talk.